Good morning. Thank you, Ms. Bastrom. Thank you for, uh, can you hear me well? Okay. Thank you to the European Commerce Register Forum and especially to the local organizers of the meeting. I appreciate the opportunity to share, uh, to go out of our ivory tower to, to share my my views, my research, on, and test those views in dialogue with uh, the real uh, world, I mean with practitioners in the field. Um, it is gratifying, the invitation, and it's also challenging because, um, as I will try to explain in a moment, there is um, very little scientific knowledge on business registries. In a way, I, I, in essence, I have good news for you, but also bad news. Um, the bad news is that registries, business registries are ignored, or worse, in most, um, in academia. Of course, in economics, but also, I would say, in, in law. We have here, in this slide, the three major perspectives that have illuminated thinking in this area. Um, I mean, the contractual theory of the firm, which is the predominant, by far, the predominant view of the firm, um, in that perspective, there is no role for business registries. I mean, the role of judges is solving disputes, and for solving disputes you need only the contract, and you need um, es essentially to compare the contract with contractual performance. And there is no need for registries in this setup. There might be need for administrative registries, but that's a totally different animal. Second, if you go into very influential analysis of institutions, mainly by um, John Wallis, in co-authorship with Doug North and Wayne Gast, who have been studying the, origin, the institutional basis of capitalism, and in particular, the emergence of the corporate form. Well, they don't pay any attention to registries. But even worse, they do pay attention to the ancient regime custom of constraining incorporation, of allowing entrepreneurs to incorporate only by royal permit, by granting a charter, etc. They pay a lot of attention to this constraint and argue that this constraint was a limiting factor in European economic development before the Industrial Revolution, etc., etc. Well, these limitations on incorporation, this idea, is what has been inspiring the thinking of economists about registries. Even if registries were created, I'm thinking mainly about company registries, were created to facilitate corporate contracting, they have not been seen that way. They have been seen as hurdles, as barriers to incorporation. I mean, this idea, which you can trace the origin to North and Wallis, is what is, in essence, behind the words of Slifer, Jankov, and all this band, which is itself the inspiring force behind the Dream Business Project, which obviously I understand is, to say it briefly, the most damaging factor in the development of these institutions in the last 50 or 100 years. Why? Because, in essence, what uh, this perspective considers is that registries are seen as barriers, therefore registries should be minimized. 
they are not totally frank about this, but they should be proposing just eliminating registries. Uh, I guess they suspect that this would be stupid, and it is stupid, but therefore they advise something very similar. They advise to minimize registries with the applause of American lawyers because, it, as it happens, uh, most of the USA has ministerial registries and registries, minimalistic registries, and given that this is the American solution, they, of course, think, assume, that this is the optimal solution. Uh, this policy has been applied in many countries with uh, very bad consequence, and I, I have been publishing papers about them describing some of these cases, analyzing some of these cases, but this is still there because journalists pay a lot of attention to this and the World Bank, even if in the World Bank many people think that this is stupid, the World Bank needs, first of all, needs to be present in the financial press because they fear, with reason, to become irrelevant. Therefore, the priority is being featured in the pages of Wall Street Journal and Financial Times and the doing business lead given that this, the numbers make good news and sell newspapers, they are featured prominently in these pages and therefore the heads of the World Bank are happy about having this initiative, which is its survival is driven essentially by this pure, I would say, gossip journalism about institutions. Well, this is the bad news and I think this is very briefly, because we don't have much time, and that sort of flashes, this part of what I wanted to say today. There are also good news, and you know more already about the good news. The good news is that registries do perform a socially valuable function. Therefore, in a way, we, I think you have a, your problem could be seeing as making sure that societies understand what is the role you play to avoid the type of mistake that is, is being made in terms of institutional reforms in this area. No? The, how to explain this good news? Well, the, the long story, or the line of the long story I would like to have time to tell you, would go from theory to empirics, and from empirics to policy consequences. Uh, as I said, given the time constraint, I will limit myself to uh, provide you with some top sort of flashes on these issues. Um, this is based on um, dozens or so of, of scientific papers that I have been publishing in the last dozen of years, more or less, or 15 years. Uh, uh, mainly, if you are curious about these issues, the, the chapter three in this book I published two, two, two years ago, um, which is chapter three in this book, which is the one I sent for uh, distribu distribution for the organizers if they want to distribute it. Um, but if you are interested, you have all of these issues which deal with different aspects of the problem. For instance, about policy, there are two papers on criticizing doing business, there is a contro controversy with the former director of doing business, Simeon Jankov, etc. Uh, you have all of these papers in my website freely available. Um, the, okay. Sorry. Yeah, theory. Well, um, how do economies see company registries? Very easy. They don't. They don't. In economics, company registries are not necessary. I mean, from the dominant economic perspective, company registries are not necessary. This explains that you have a tough time if you want to explain the value of your function. And why is this? Simply because the predominant I mean, the model we have in our mind is this very simple model. I mean, the, everything that happens in the economy is of this type. 
There are two parties, I call them here P and A, principal and agent, but you can call it the way you want. There are two parties, they grant a, a contract, get an agreement, and the most they may be needing is a judge. And in many cases, they don't even need a judge because they have reputation. For example, they have repeated interactions and they don't need a judge. In many cases, they contract, the structure of the contract, and we did some empirical research on this, the structure of the contract tried to put away judges. But this is a very simple, simplistic understanding of economic activity. Clearly, this is the model behind behind Coase, behind Akerlof, I mean, I would say the two pillars of the economic analysis of contracts, two parties, one contract, one transaction. Well, uh, here you, you may have a contract, and well, but the contract, the two parties have the contract. The judge may need, for instance, to see the contract, but the two parties have the contract, they contribute the contract. There is no much to gain from having an independent registry. I will say, I mean, I am not a law scholar, but I could say that most of law also have this model in mind. And think about it, because my suspicion after having been many years working in this area is that um, law scholars don't understand the role of registries. Look at the way they teach registry law. As a secondary chapter, in many cases, if, they are, if the time is lacking, they don't even teach it. In England, in Australia, they have, well, this is in the area of real estate, of land, of property law. I mean, they had torrents registries there for the last 100 years or so. Well, it is only six or seven years that for the first time in both countries, Australia and England, the first time there are books of property law focusing on transactions on registered land. Up to now, they were teaching in reverse. They were teaching deception as the general case and the general case as an exceptional case. I mean, look at how your the law is taught in your schools, and you might find something very similar. This explains a lot later on when institutional reforms are discussed. I mean, the framework people have in their minds is a pre-registry, purely private parties contracting world. This is this type of world. And there is an implicit coalition here, therefore, between law scholars and um, writers of law, and economists. I mean, you are fighting a very difficult battle here. Obviously, you know better, you know that at least we, have, we should have this type of much more, com I call it sequential exchange, this complex structure in which at least there are three parties, there are two contracts, and contracts are in interaction. This is much more complex. The most obvious thing is because if there will be a judicial decision, the judge will need evidence, as always, but evidence about what? Evidence about a previous contract. For instance, there is a litigation about this contract, but the, the, the subsequent transaction, but the litigation will very often be between an owner, or between previous shareholders and new shareholders. And in the middle, the subsequent transaction has been between a manager, a representative, and the new shareholders. And the decision by the judge is going to be giving priority to all shareholders or new shareholders. <coughs> And given that the decision in the, the, the subsequent contract was based on a, some sort of authorization defined in an, what I call an originative transaction, a previous transaction, therefore the judge needs evidence on this originative transaction. 
how this evidence can be produced in a reliable manner. This is the essence of reliability. It's not reliability in the way it is usually thought. I would call it verifiability. Why? Because the, it's not a problem at all of physical dimensions of quality. It's a problem of impartiality and what is the proper scope of impartiality. Look, to, to see something, this is very simple. Here you have only two parties. To arrange an impartial structure here is very easy. For instance, the two parties can agree to develop an impartial structure. Go to a certain notary, for instance, or go to a certain certifying agency, or choose a registry. Things here are far more, more complex because there are three parties, at least. And these three parties, there is at least one party which is not present. In many cases, it's even not known at the time when the choice has to be made between the cert who is going to certify the contract, etc. Therefore, impartiality is much more harder to structure. In other way, there are third parties who are not present in the transaction and their interests must be protected for the system to, to work. Um, there are technical issues here. As I said, I am trying just to give you a, a flavor of the, of the story. There are many in corporations, there are plenty. All corporate law has this structure. This is a, historically, it's a tremendously important case. Hidden the liability, the limited liability status of a limited liability partnership. I mean, this was in the ancient regime, in the 18th century, in the whole continent, was very important. There were no reliable registries. And people there arrange companies, sort of companies, with limited liability of a wealthy partner. But then, when they started business, they indicated to creditors that liability was unlimited. Afterwards, depending on the evolution of business, they chose. They chose to, if, if the company was bankrupt, the wealthy partner said, no, I, I had limited liability. You know, no, 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 limited, limited. Look at the papers, limited, limited. This example tells you something very important, that it's essential to commit people to their choices. I mean, in the first originative transaction, it's good to give people freedom, because they know what's best. Freedom in the choice of rules, for instance, limited or unlimited, it's good that they choose. However, the system might, must, might be, must, must be protected, I mean, they have to choose ex ante. You cannot allow them to be able to choose after the uncertainty of how the business is evolving is solved, because uh, this would provide plenty of bad incentives. Therefore, commitment, which is in essence the same as verifiability, is of the essence. There are more cases. I, I will not go into the details here. Well, I, I, will, I will not go anyway. Yes, sale on shares, company representation in general, the same happens. No? Has the representative authority, legal authority, or not? Well, it's good for, to have freedom to the parties to decide, but committing them to their choices. In essence, all of these problems, all of these cases, pose a very simple problem, which is the following. Principles and agents, contractual parties, contract and specialize. And they specialize not in producing, but in contracting. There's a type of specialization here, which is they are contractual specialists. The essence here is that the manager, for instance, in a corporation, is going to contract with third parties committing the principle. Therefore, there is a dilution of principles property in a way, or committing the company, committing the shareholders, etc., depending on the circumstances. We can 
cannot allow them to collude. There is a risk that some people will collude in this structure, as in the example I mentioned about limited liability. If this happens, if there is a chance that this may happen, put yourself in the position of third parties. You are going to assume the worst. And you are going to assume the worst about everybody. Therefore, there is a market failure, what we economists call an externality. The fact that there are some potential cheaters, some people who is going to cheat, means that all third parties will anticipate cheating and will enter or not enter these contracts, but modifying their offers. Therefore, all others, imagine that there are a 10% of cheaters and a 90% of non-cheaters in this market. Well, given that third parties have no way of identifying them, or is costly to identify them perfectly, then many of them will assume that all of them are cheaters. Therefore, let's say the good ones are going to pay the price. The good one, ones suffer an externality. No? The way of solving this, this, in principle, could be, well, we don't need to stay. Let the parties arrange systems for solving this problem. For the reasons I explained before, this is not likely to succeed. Because we are not in the type of simple problem with two parties. Here there are three, par three parties and the third party is absent. Therefore, the decision made by po two potential cheaters is not going to protect this ignorant third party. We need, therefore, a different type of protection. The solution we have evolved slowly over centuries, very slowly. Okay, next slide. Okay, thank you. No? Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Well, the solution is, and corporate law has evolved with ups and downs, but have consistently evolved in this direction. Let's protect third parties, I mean, with, against all sorts of risks. If managers, for instance, uh, uh, make decisions which they are not authorized, managers of companies, representatives of companies. Well, third parties are protected, etc. Principles consent is preserved because it is then who appoint the managers or who grant the authority. However, the most important point is that commitment has to be preserved. In essence, providing verifiability is the function of company registries. This verifiability can be provided in two different manners. And we see plenty of solutions in different countries in this continuum. I mean, this verifiability can be provided as a byproduct of transactions. I mean, for instance, if someone is publicly acting as representative of a company, in some jurisdictions, it is not necessary for this person to be formally registered. In other cases, it is required a formal registration of this, of this person or of this company, etc. In other words, we have an application of rules, I suppose, that protect third parties that enable the market, enable a type of transaction which is very interesting because it's impersonal. I mean, third parties don't need to spend resources examining contracts because they are protected. It's very similar to what happens in land registration when you are really in land registration in a Torres registry or a registry of title. The third party is protected in that case in REM. Well, in companies, there are no in-rent rights. Well, there is something very similar, functionally, economically, which is the establishment of priorities. And in, 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 in a way, in-rent means 
privileged priority access to assets. And here is a bit of the same. The assets are not so precisely defined because these are the assets of the company, but functionally is very similar. Therefore, you protect third parties, and this protection, this judicial decision, is based on publicly a very, a verifiable information, which means information which is not uh, modifiable by parties exposed. Parties are free, in many cases, to choose the rules applicable, but they are free ex ante, before the subsequent contracts. Here, this is, just say, the general model of business registries. We can extend the model to analyze different types of registries, considering that a company contracting is much more complex this, this, than these two, two steps, I mean two contracts. In company transactions, there is a least, at the very least, there is a, this three-step contracting, you know, like the formation of a company, the structural changes, and then subsequent contracts with third parties. And in, in this continuum, you can easily identify different registries. For instance, starting, well, this would be England or Britain before the 1844 Registration Act. I mean, Britain at that time had corporations by royal charter, but also had a very interesting organization, animal, which was called unincorporated companies. These were companies created purely by private contract. Purely by private contract. There is a relatively recent book by Ross Harris, professor of Tel Aviv, which tells the story of these corporations. It's very beautiful to examine how they work. And very beautiful to examine how costly the litigation was of these companies. Because all shareholders at some point, also they were litigating against all the shareholders of these companies. Because was a purely contractual ent entity. Well, some would say in legal terms that they were not incorporated. In fact, they used to call them unincorporated companies. I mean, but um, it tells you very clearly the difficulties. It tells you it is possible to have a company without registration, I mean, without incorporation, in fact. However, it is very, very costly. Understandably, the, the English end up creating the register in 1844, very late, which is very interesting in itself. In a way, it's at the end of the Industrial Revolution. Well, um, you have also the American solution, what the American lawyers call a ministerial registry. I mean, a registry that acts like a, simply like a depository of contracts repository of legal acts, without practically no compliance review. Well, they might review, for instance, the payment of registration fees, I think, these days review, but very little less, some formal attributes for indexing or something like that. Obviously, you may have this type of intermediate solution in which there is some compliance review at the beginning, or some more compliance for all acts. This would be, I would say, the German, or to some extent the European, to the extent that the German model has been implanted in the whole of Europe, but with differences, you know, the Spanish, the Spanish model in which there is plenty of review. Well, here there is a very interesting issue, and I understand that um, one of your, I was impressed by this survey that you, are, that you are doing. One of the issues that I think would be very interesting would be to explore empirically discontinuing, discontinuing a solution, because obviously there are trade-offs here. There are trade-offs. You can, here you have different countries which provide a decent uh, environment for business uh, with very different solutions. No? I did a little bit together with uh, um, uh, American uh, professor, Char Charlie Manzanares. Uh, we did an empirical test of some of these Ah. 
Next, yeah. Of these trade-offs, sorry, this is go, it's going backwards. Can we move forward? <laughs> no, no, it's there, I think. There. No, 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 no. Well, how are we doing in terms of time? Okay, okay. Uh, if we move a, a little bit forward, ¿podemos avanzar en lugar de retroceder, por favor? Más, 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 más. Ah, stop. Well, um, this is not about the trade-offs, but it's important. I mean, um, in this paper I distribute, I tell a little bit about this story, which for me is passing. I think it's very very important for, for you uh, as being working in this field to understand. Um, capitalism, modern capitalism is born in, in, in the low middle ages you know, with merchants in the 12th, 13th century. You know. At that time there is plenty of merchant law and it is in this sphere of merchant law that the rules, the law of commerce is developed. A very important aspect here is that what you see in green there develops and starts applying and is enforced from that time. The main development here is that good faith buyers are protected in rent, in commerce, from that era. In other words, the entrusting of possession from a merchant to another merchant dilutes the property rights of this owner. And even if the seller, for instance, doesn't pay to the supplier, the innocent third party is going to be kept in possession of the acquired assets. And this, in many dimensions. It's true for movables, but it's also true for bills of exchange and with variants for many. Therefore, for all these solutions based, based on possession, documentary possession or physical possession, um, the system, the legal system, moves away from the traditional Roman solution, diluting property rights and enabling impersonal exchange. This is decided not by judges. This is decided not by lawyers. This is decided, this developed by practitioners, in essence by merchants. And in fact, lawyers of the time fought this evolution. Probably because this solution made them less relevant. But they evolved in this direction. Commerce evolved in this direction in this way. They switch substantially, drastically, the rules of adjudication and enable impersonal exchange. This didn't happen in real estate and didn't happen in companies. And there was plenty of demand at that time for this to happen. The merchants were constantly asking the Crown to develop registries in both areas. And the Crown tried a little bit, but didn't succeed. This type of competition between interest groups is also behind some of the issues we are seeing now. Um, the second piece of evidence, and this do, does go, if we move yeah, here, an indication of the trade-offs that I was mentioning. When we compare the stem of legal opinions issued by lawyers what is in essence a part, a substantial part of due diligence, what we are examining in this paper is there, is there substitution between registries and lawyers? I mean, is there substitution when registries are more effective, do more compliance review, is the work of lawyers easier? Very simple, but 
This question is not asked, for instance, by doing business. Not at all, because it's focusing only on ex-ante costs, not on this exposed benefit. Well, what we find statistically, cross-country, is a very substantial impact. When registries do compliance review, the work of lawyers becomes trivial. By the way, I found very similar facts and measure very similar facts in real estate. The same happens. If you have a good registry, the role of conveyances become relatively trivial. And they, their fees are much lower and their work is much lower. This is happening here, too, with, with, with legal opinions. No? Therefore, and I finish in 30 seconds, um, just remember three ideas in this area. Registries are required, are necessary. However, remember that um, most people don't see them as necessary. Partially because registries are given for granted. They are there and people don't understand because they, they are assumed that they are there. They, 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 can't, they cannot even imagine a world without registries. But some reforms, in fact, this, some of these simplification reforms, especially in developing countries, are destroying the, 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 the registry available. No? Um, registries are not tool boots. The registries are not barriers, or not mainly barriers. Registries are facilitators of sports trade. And clearly, we should, in my opinion, the key should, should be in exploring trade-offs, in exploring for the design of the registries what is better, what is worse, where should we place more or less review, etc. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much uh, to Benito Aranyuda for this. And um, I think for, for a lot of us that are very operational and we are there on, in everyday life, it's interesting to, to listen to something from a quite academic way how you explain the business or the registers, the view of this. Please, uh, if you have any questions, remember them, write them down, but, uh, and we will try to have some minutes in the end of the presentations. Welcome back. Welcome back to uh, the second session for today. Uh, I know that I've said many times this morning that we should, uh, we should network and, and we should really get to know each other and I think it's fantastic. Uh, I'm very happy that you take this opportunity. But I also would like very much to go on with the program so we will continue now. We are, we are working on the, the technical finding a solution for this, and I think it's important to, have, um, to see if we can have Magda around the floor. But before we continue, I would like to ask you if you have any questions to Mr. Benito and Julia before we continue with the, the re results of the, this year's survey. So please, is there any, are there any questions or Reflections that you want to raise? Andreas, there is a mic. Hello. Uh, it was a really interesting uh, presentation, Benito. Uh, it always is a pleasure to hear you. Uh, could you make an, an estimation of the impact of uh, having a, a, the institution of business register that works 
in the growth or in the PIB or in, in the economy? I mean, I know that's impossible, but I mean, uh, is there any way to measure that or to, to make an estimation in about the impact of these institutions in the economy? Well, there are empirical studies of um, very limited um, scope, let's say, and they pose serious problems of um, external validity. Uh, you can measure something, I mean, the impact of in a region of creating. Uh, it is debatable even the impact in that region and the extrapolation out of the region is very, very, very hard. It's not. Uh, I wouldn't, uh, numbers are very hard in this area, but um, I can give you, we were talking over coffee, for instance, about a recent development. Um, as you may know, it's, in a, it's a business registry, but of a very different kind, but it's in the same industry. In the USA, after the crisis, the recent financial crisis, um, they were worried about the market for financial options because they were traded over the counter. Well, trading over the counter is trading privately, secretly. It's the normal type of trading that we study in law and economics between parties trading together. No? They trade personally, they know each other. And they, this market is produced by Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, and the, the major banks. No? Uh, they observe, during the, after the crisis, they observe that this trading produce, the privacy of this trading provoke substantial negative externalities. Why? Because there was no way of estimating the overall risk of the market. This was one of the issues. And therefore they regulated the market. There are another there were another negative aspects closely related to my points because those selling the options knew much more than those sold buying the options and there was substantial information asymmetry. Therefore, we can infer from that that the whole market was much smaller than it could be. The, the, the US government decided, well, people will continue, will be free to continue trading these options privately. However, in many cases, regulated cases, they will have to um, process these options, these financial options, through platforms, which in essence are the registries, through platforms. Some could call them organized exchanges. Well, organized exchanges for derivatives, for financial derivatives, are very, very similar to registries, especially to registries of rights, to registries with a strong legal review. They produce legal commodities. No? Well, in this case, I was reading last week that McKinsey has estimated that the losses, the direct losses, for those previously making this market, I mean the Goldman Sachs of this world, were 4. billion US dollars every year. Simply the introduction of these platforms. There you have a number. But this number is a clear underestimation of the impact. Why? Because this is only the reduction in fees by these, these banks, which are in fact acting as conveyancers in real estate or as lawyers in, in other markets. You have you could, to, to, to analyze the economic impact, you could have to add something much more important, which is the expansion of the market driven by this institutional development. Uh, this is, a, a good, I think, a good illustration of the type of, of issue involved. Well, um, do you have any other questions at the moment? I think you will be here for the day together with us, so take the opportunity 
also. So once again, thank you very much. Thank you.